All right, so I'm going to talk about the Fajaya pop-off tricks today. Um, that was something that I tried to fit into the last lecture of the last semester, but um, it just wasn't time. Um, I brought up my notes on this, and they're in um, sections 17.14 and 17.15 of that online book that I'm writing. Um, it's, I'll also cut them out of, um, of the big PDF and put a little PDF in the um, 524 webpage. Okay, so before I start though, is, are there any questions that someone would like to ask before we Remember, questions are rewarded by chocolate. Uh, well, I definitely, uh, <laughs> definitely, uh, if you could give us like a work, right? a work that example of a path integral, would that be nice? Well, they, they, if you look at the beginning of chapter 17, I do several examples. Okay, no, okay, I'll just go on that. Yeah, I think that would be, that would be good to work through slowly. There's also a very nice book called um, Quantum Mechanics and Path Integrals, I think is the name of it, by Feynman and Hibbs. It was published for a while by McGraw-Hill, who had so little, um, so few scruples that they, that when they last published it, they used thinner paper to save money and they couldn't fit the title on the, they didn't bother to fit the title on the spine. And so instead of quantum mechanics and path integrals, it's, I think quantum mechanics, and they left out one of the five words. I don't remember what it is. And it wasn't and. They might have left and out also, but they left out integrals of path or quantum or mechanics. It's pretty pathetic. Anyway. Uh, Dover Publications has printed a new ver uh, has printed it and sells it cheaply, and um, it's a better edition than the original because various typos have been corrected. Well, I found a typo in it when I was looking. At it. All right. Well, let's just look at the action for a generic gauge theory minus a quarter f b mu nu f. Gamma mu d mu plus m psi d four of x. Okay, so that's a, a generic action. Um, what does the subscript b refer to? B is the um, if we're talking QCD, it's the color index. I don't know what has happened to these blackboards. They're virtually they're just completely filthy and virtually unerasable. Um, the, 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 the janitors erase them perfectly at night and by the time four o'clock has come on, and it's just a disgrace. Can you guys see this stuff? Okay, uh, so it's a color index. F, B, mu, nu, well actually, let's get another chocolate. <laughs> F is D, mu, so in the case of QCD, there are eight gauge fields. In the case of SU2, there are three gauge fields, three values of B. And then and of course the covariant derivative for the Fermi field, the fermion is d mu psi minus i g, a generator, the beef generator, the beef gauge field, and then the fermion field. So that's what we're starting with. Um,
Okay. So what we're looking at is the time ordered product of a bunch of operators, and each of these operators is assumed to be gauge invariant. Omega is the actual physical vacuum, and this is O1 through ON. E to the I, the action, which is an action functional of the gauge fields. It's actually a functional of the gauge fields and the Fermi fields. And then what we talked about last time was that if we're in the axial gauge, where we set the three third component of each of the gauge fields equal to zero, then um, we can write this as a ratio of path integrals of this form. Okay. And here this delta of say A B three, and I'm not singling out B. This is meant to be a product over all of these. This is, so this is equal to a product over x and b of delta of a3b or b3 at x, all x's. OK, so that's the starting point. We have that kind of a functional integral. And um, this is an example of such a functional integral. We could have started in a different gauge, um, Coulomb gauge, or which has certain problems, or temporal gauge, or some other gauge, and we, we could have gotten an expression um, like this. In fact, the point of, 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 one, of the, one of the points of today's lecture and the Bade Popo tricks is that it doesn't matter what gauge you use, uh, ratios like this can express, um, no matter what the gauge fixing conditions are, can, can, uh, are a correct formula for the time order product. And moreover, this thing, each of these, no matter how, no matter what the gauge fixing condition is, each of these will be a ratio of integrals in which you path integrate over all the gauge fields without fixing the, gauge, the gauges at all. So you integrate over all gauges. So, so, um, so let's look at what happens to a gauge field under an air pump, an infinitesimal gauge transformation. The mu gauge field at point x well, let's leave out the x. To be a little bit clearer. We don't make that explicit. It's first of all the gauge field itself. Then it's the derivative of the beef gauge parameter. And then it's a g, a structure constant, b, c, d, lambda, d, a, c, mu. So that's, that's what it is to lowest order. And that's something we worked out last semester. Now, um, let me just, yeah. OK. Now, when the gauge fields change, the um, a gauge fixing condition such as this uh, also changes. And so let's, let's let me use a notation. Fb of x is a, say, a3b of x. So, so this will be the this would be the axial gauge condition. Another possibility is um, Fb of x might be i d mu a mu b of x. So this would be a Lorentz gauge condition, and so these are the F's are the gauge fixing um, conditions. 
and I'm going to use the notation B. This is a functional of the gauge fixing condition, and um, it is then a product over X and B of delta of FB of X. So this is the so, so what exactly happened and how did the gauge fixing condition become that? I did not hear. Sorry. What was the question? So uh, just for me, <laughs> I couldn't understand how what, what exactly happened there. How did the gauge condition become that? So you, you well, these are possible gauge. What, 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 what we're doing here is considering a general. This is a particular example for axial gauge. Yes. Now we're going to consider ratios like this, but more general, in which we have an arbitrary gauge fixing condition. Oh, okay. So if B of X is one example sign. is axial gauge. Another example would be temporal gauge. Another example, Lorentz gauge. And, and what is the first line over there on the top? The first line there? This is how the gauge, how a gauge field transforms under an infinitesimal gauge fix, a gauge transformation. Okay. And the lambda <laughs> is the infinitesimal gauge transformation. So lambda is thought to be small. All right. So, B of F for the axial gauge will look like this. This is the gauge fixing condition. XB, and it's just delta of A3B of X, as I wrote before. In an axial gauge, it might look like this. Pi over 2 integral FB. So this is um, all right. So so there are various possibilities for B. Um, So what we're going to do is we're going to consider a, a formula for the time on a product. So as we, why I keep writing the whole in. We're going to write it as BF J DA D size. Jacobian of 
this transform, it's the Jacobian of how F changes under the infinitesimal gauge transformation. So J is the determinant of actually a variational derivative of F lambda P of X with respect to lambda C of Y at lambda equals zero. So it's So that's what J is. And in this particular case, um, F is just this. And so what we're talking about then is the determinant of how A3B of lambda changes with lambda at Y. Again, lambda equals zero. And we look at it at this expression, and we see that um, it's equal to essentially this term here, that is to say it's the determinant of delta BC, so it's only <coughs> true when B is, it's only non-zero when B is equal to C, then it's D mu of delta function of x minus y, and of course that doesn't involve the gauge field, so that's, um, that's a constant. The idea here is that we're taking this derivative um, not only of lambda equal to zero, but at a point in which we're already satisfying whatever the gauge fixing condition is, and um, <coughs> that gauge fixing condition uh, is that A3 is zero. So this term doesn't contribute. This term is gone for, um, for uh, the, th the third, the th from mu equal to three, this term is gone because there aren't any three gauge fields. And so the only part left is this. And so it's just the derivative of this with respect to um, lambda c of y. And so that's delta v c, delta x minus y, and then the derivative is just sitting there. And so that's just some function of x and y, but it doesn't involve the fields. And so from the point of view of, a, of um, the path integral, it's just some constant that cancels. So in other words, this, for the axial case, reduces to this once you cancel the check. So, uh, but why is the why is the Jacobian only? And why why does it have only the S F's in it? And why would would you expect the Jacobian to be the the one that you get from the first line over there for the gauge transformation? How the fields transform under the gauge transformation? Under the infinitesimal Right, we, we're considering A, the case where lambda is infinitesimal. Yes. And we're considering it, um, we're considering it with this B here, where B <coughs> in this particular case here is delta of AB3. So we're considering the, we're considering the the gauge fixing condition satisfied, then under that condition, what is the change in A3? What, what, what is the change in A3? Okay. All right. So, um, it turns out that of course, just as the integral of f of y dy is the same thing as the integral of f of x dx, you can transform all the variables by a gauge transformation 
and you haven't done anything. So this is equal to O1 lambda, OM lambda, EVI S lambda, B of F lambda, J lambda, D of A lambda, D psi lambda, over e to the i s lambda b f lambda j lambda t a lambda t psi lambda. Now we're assuming that we've set this up so that this is gauge invariant, that's gauge invariant. The actions gauge invariant, all of these things, operators are gauge invariant. Yeah, I, this is the worst time I'm teaching. Is this an emergency? Sorry. Okay, so this is gauge invariant, that's gauge invariant, that's gauge invariant, these guys are gauge invariant. So we can write this then as O1, ON. E to the I S, but B is not gauge invariant, maybe because F isn't, J isn't, and then we have D A B psi divided by integral E to the I S, B of F lambda, J lambda, D A B psi. All right, so that's where we are. Now, Let's figure out what this uh, J lambda is. Now, J lambda. Okay. So this is the determinant of this variational derivative of F lambda lambda B of X with respect to lambda C of Y at lambda equals zero. So what is this? This is a determinant of an integral, really, of, sorry, f lambda lambda b of x with respect to lambda lambda d of z. And then the variational derivative of lambda, lambda, d, z, with respect to lambda, c, of y, e to a z, and little lambda, e to a z. Okay. Now, <coughs> determinants have the nice property that the determinant this is basically a product of matrices. These things are infinite dimensional matrices. This is a product of these infinite dimensional matrices. The determinant of product is the product of the determinants. And so this is actually the determinant of the first one, f lambda lambda b of x lambda lambda d Z, what little lambda equals zero, determinant variational derivative of lambda lambda d of z with respect to lambda c of y, also lambda equals zero. Okay. Now, if we set little lambda equals zero here, then this thing is just determinant of f big lambda b of x with respect to lambda d of z. And this, this one doesn't change, so it's determinant of lambda lambda d of z lambda c of y. All right, now, so that's what J lambda is, the product of these two things. So and I'm going to write this. Do you do the end? 
What? What did we do here? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm lost. What happened to the integral and yeah. how well, did you know that that's what you guys were left with? Why did, why did, well, what did you do in the, yeah. what, well, what set it to zero, what, what actually did you do? It's, we're subjecting F, which in this, in, 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 which might just be A3. But it might be something more complicated. It's a general ga uh, gauge fixing condition. We're subjecting it to two successive gauge transformations. Okay, there are two successive gauge transformations. Right. And then we're and that's why we had this. Yeah. That's right. And then we're saying, well, in this transformation, the derivative of that with respect to lambda lambda. The limit lambda going to zero is just this. Yeah, so in the limit lambda going to zero, it is just the identity transformation. So you just have one equation. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to rewrite this. Um, uh, sorry, Kevin. I, uh, but so, how again is it that the uh, integration went away from the top line to the middle line? Uh, Shashank said something, but I don't get it. All right. Hold on. Let me just. Or am I just not? Uh, let's see. Oh, that's because the integration was matrix multiplication. This oh. is the determinant of a product of infinite matrices. It's the product of the determinant of the infinite matrices. Okay. And let me just right. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to rewrite this as d f lambda d lambda times d lambda lambda d lambda lambda equals zero. So I'm just rewrite. I'm using this notation for this structure here. Let's see, I have to give out a number of chocolates because we have three more questions. Okay, one for you. Sorry. One for you. And who wants one of these? Let me ask you. And go sign. All right. So now. What we're going to do is we've got this ratio here. And we've got the expression that this time ordered product over here is equal to this ratio for any capital lambda, any gauge transformation capital lambda. And so what we can do is we can take a we can integrate over lambda in the numerator and denominator with an arbitrary weight function. And we'll still have the time order product. So in other words, and what, what weight function are we going to use? We're going to integrate with the following weight function, rho of lambda. First of all, we're going to sub substitute j lambda. For j lambda, we're going to write this. In fact, maybe I should do that. So it's an integral. And remember, here they're operators, over here they're functions. Now, J lambda is I'll leave out the lambda equal to zero. Now we're going to say, well, 
we can integrate over lambda. Whoops, that's lambda. We can integrate over lambda, and we're gonna, we can use an arbitrary weight function. And so the arbitrary weight function that we're going to use is this thing here, which doesn't involve the fields. This involves the fields, but this just involves lambda. So this is going to be cancels this. And so what we've got is O1, ON, E to the IS, EF lambda, um, DF lambda, D e lambda, and I put the D lambda there now, DA psi, over integral e to the is b of f lambda df df lambda d lambda d lambda d a d sine. Okay. Now, evidently, df lambda d lambda times d lambda is just df. So this thing is the same thing as what? How is that so obvious that is what is that Well this is the change in F with respect to lambda. And this is the change in lambda, so this is really the change in F. So we have O1 O n e to the i s, and now b of f lambda d f lambda d a d sine over integral o sorry. this stage. But now, the integral b of f ds, which is some number, and so we're down to simply O1, Owen, e to the is, da, e psi, over integral e to the is dA e psi. So here we're integrating over all gauge fields. Okay, so that's a very nice formula. And it is a general formula for the mean band and the physical vacuum time order product of a bunch of gauge gauge variant operators. So is it completely independent of what it's Right. It's there are two lessons, it's two two or three lessons here. First of all, it's independent of how we quantize the theory in the beginning, whether we were using temporal gauge or axial gauge, and if axial gauge was at A1 or A2 or A3 or we're using Lorentz gauge or, or uh, Coulomb gauge or something else. Whatever it was, it's always that. Okay, that's the first lesson. The second lesson is that we can choose any gauge we want to quantize in. And now, if we're doing lattice gauge theory, 
then we would use that expression or the equivalent Euclidean expression. Euclidean expression, let me just say, would be Euclidean time order product of O1, ON would be integral O1, ON, E to the minus SE dA d psi over integral e to the minus se dA d psi. And this is what's used in lattice gauge theory. What is implied by Euclidean here? Work rotation. All right, what's, what's, let's see, who asked the question? That was me. Okay, so I owe you a chocolate. Um, I'm thinking of it this way. First of all, the, the time, Euclidean time dependence is via e to the minus th rather than e to the minus i th. So that's what this means. Secondly, this thing, instead of being an integral, instead of being e to the i action, it's e to the minus the energy, it's e to the minus the Hamiltonian density integrated over time. So this is, um, this S sub e is then, at least for the gate, for the boson fields, it's normally a strictly positive quantity. Or at least it's bounded below, let's say. And um, so this is a very well behaved thing mathematically. Can I ask a question about something you did a little bit before? <clears throat> On that um, top line where you have uh, d lambda times uh, d lambda 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 over d little lambda, and then you have the inverse of that, how did that come in? I, I, I don't really get that. Right, hold on here. Um, what was the question? So that top line, you have that thing over that here? has to, uh, right, so at the end of that line, you have uh, you know that derivative to the minus one. Right, so and this the, cancels yeah. that. And this cancels that. Yes. Right, that I see. But when did that come in again? Oh, we what we had was that that was equal to this. Apart from these factors here. Right. But. It's independent of big lambda. In other words, this time ordered product is this ratio, forget about this, this ratio for all lambda, big lambda. And for that reason, we could write the expression as it's equal to the ratio for one lambda. And then we could say, well, it's the average of that with the ratio for another lambda, with the ratio for a third lambda, and so forth. But um, that's the same thing as just uh, integrating over the numerator and integrating over the denominator. Okay. Okay. And And so we just uh, we do that with an arbitrary weight function that depends upon lambda. So this is just some weight function of lambda. It doesn't matter if we weight if we weight this ratio for one lambda more than for another, because uh, for every lambda it gives the same time order product. So that's the idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So now. What we've done is we've seen everything is as nice as it could be, which indicates that the theory is more or less right. But um, what we don't know is how to do perturbation theory. We don't want to use, these are fine expressions for lattice gauge theory, 
but they're not good expressions for doing perturbation theory because in perturbation theory, uh, we want to be as economical as possible, and so we want to fix the gauge. All right, and so what we're going to do then for perturbation theory, and this is where the ghosts come in, is we're going to say that uh, omega time order product n over one over n omega equals, and now we're going back to the formulation we started with, EDIS e of f sum j ta d psi integral EDIS bf j dA d psi, but what we learned is that it doesn't matter what we use for b or f. We can pick and choose. All right, so we're going to pick. We're going to say fb of x is i d mu a mu b of x. So instead of axial, this is a Lorentz gauge condition. This is a nice condition because it's relativistically covariant. And for B, remember there wasn't any restriction at all on B. It just went away. So for B, we're going to use that one that I wrote down earlier, e to the minus i over 2 integral <coughs> d mu a mu b of x squared d4 of x, and it's summed over b. <coughs> so that's what we're using. All right, well, that means that we uh, that we now have the product e to the i s b f is now e to the i s whoops minus i over two integral d mu a mu b <coughs> squared d four x. So we've added to the action this funny term funny. This is a term, this is what we did in electrodynamics, but we only have one B. In fact, since it was one B, we didn't even use it as a B. And the effect of that, if you remember, was to give us a propagator that was a very nice propagator. So in other words, what we found then was, so we're doing perturbation theory now, and so I could have put zero in there, right? Because we're really just doing perturbation. So this is time order product A B mu X A C nu Y is now minus I delta mu nu of X minus Y minus I integral. A, it's the same thing as in electrodynamics, except for this conic delta, Q squared minus I epsilon, E to the I Q, X minus Y, E fourth Q, 2 pi to the fourth. Okay. So what we've done then for the non-abelian case is gotten ourselves a very nice propagator, which is Okay, but we still got J sitting here. Okay, so B is gone. In fact, B has been very helpful. But now we have to deal with um, J. What's J? Well, remember, under infinitesimal gauge transformations, A lambda B mu is a b mu plus d mu lambda b plus g f b c d whoops 
the numbers commute, so this would be okay, but let me just write it the way I that's odd. Oh, that's well. If it's a typo, it's a small one. Let me just make sure. Yeah. Okay. So what is f lambda b? Well, it's i d mu a lambda b mu, and so a lambda b mu is this. So we do an I D mu on that, and an I D mu, A D mu plus D mu lambda B plus G F B D C. What? Lambda C, A D mu. Okay. So that's what we've got. And now we want to compute the variational derivative of this with respect to <coughs> lambda c of y at lambda equals zero. Okay. Well, there's a term here, there's also a term there in this particular case. And so what we're getting then is i here, we're getting a delta dc, chronic delta dc, and then we have d mu d mu, which we often write as a box, and then this variational derivative, this is at x, this is at y, so we have delta 4 of x minus y. That's from this term. But now we have this term, and this term is I G F B D C D D X mu of A mu D of X delta four X minus one. Okay. All right. And now the determinant J is the determinant of this. So J is determinant of I delta B C why I'm writing all this again delta X minus Y plus I G F B D C D D X mu A mu D of X delta 4 X minus Y the X minus Y of course came from Differentiating with respect to this, this is an x and this is a y. Where did the dx mean? Where does the dx come from? That came from, that was this. It's an x, but this delta x y is because that's an x, and this is a y. And I see I've left out something actually because <coughs> oh, there was a delta. Had I used e here. which I should have probably, then there would be a delta EC, which would have turned that into a C, which turned that into a C, so that's what I've got. All right, now, as I said to you last time, back in the last lecture, the beginning of the last lecture, last semester, I showed that, um, I showed you how it was that, um, at least for simple, Two by two determinants. A two by two determinant. Two by two determinants. Um, that the, a, a determinant. Some 
matrix A can be written as a fermion dependent integral. E to the minus theta dagger A theta. Product K equals 1 to N. Well, this is an N by N determinant. D theta star K D theta K. All right. So that's from this Grassman integration. It's explained in detail, I think, in section 16. 16? And, all right. That means that we can write this Jacobian as an integral e to the minus i. We're going to use omega instead of theta. Omega star b box omega b plus i d mu omega b star <coughs> g f b d c a mu d omega c <coughs> d fourth x and then down here d omega star d omega. All right, so that means that we've got new terms in the action. We've got a new field in the action. Remember the real fermion fields are represented by Grassmann fields. So now we've got a, but spinner Grassmann fields. Now we've got a scalar Grassmann field, but, that's, but it's Grassmann, so it's representing a scalar fermion because violates spin statistics, but it's just a mathematical trick anyway. <coughs> and so what we've got is a new term in Lagrangian in the action that contributes the terms minus d mu omega b star, d mu omega b, and d mu omega b star d f b d c a mu d omega c to the action. So new terms. And so the... Um, so quick, quick question. Kevin. So yeah. There in the first line, so the, the, the first thing you have in e to the minus i, everything up like up to that before you add the new terms. This that, is a, yeah. That was an integration been, sign there. Okay, and that would have been good also for bosonic fields. If the if if the don't uh, if the omega is more in Grassmann fields, if the omega is more in Grassmann fields, they, they weren't Grassmann fields then. They could also this, this integration wouldn't give the determinant, it would actually give one over the determinant. Okay. It turns out that such an integral is essentially one over the determinant. Well, the I'm e not absolutely certain, of, but it's roughly one over the okay. Anyway, let me just say what the effect of Lagrangian is. So the effect of fatty of pop off. Lagrange density now is minus a quarter FB mu nu FB mu nu minus a half D mu A mu B squared. Oh, I left out the fermion. Oh, you know I didn't at the end. Minus D mu omega star B D mu omega B plus d mu omega star b g f b d c a mu d omega c plus the matter of Lagrangian. So that's the new action for perturbation theory in the Lorentz gauge. So this part here gives us a nice propagator <coughs> for, the, for the gluons or the 
gauge bosons more generally. But remember that F has a term that's linear in A, quadratic in A, and cubic in A. No, linear in A and quadratic in A. Consequently, the product of two of them gives you terms that are quadratic in A, cubic in A, and quartic in A. So this gives you diagrams like this and diagrams like that, as well as the quadratic part, which gives you this propagation. Then we get something new. We get that, and the something new is these things which are called ghosts. They're called ghosts because you, they can't represent incoming or outgoing physical particles. Instead, they can only be internal lines in the Feynman diagram. And the basic ghost, so if we agree to write a gluon, a gauge boson as a wavy line, and we can write a fermion line, fermion lines like this, and then a fermion gauge boson interaction will look like that. And that comes from this thing, which I could have just said here, this lateral rungeon might as well put it in, it's um, minus psi bar, um, well, why don't I write it as d slash plus psi. Yeah, there we are, that's economical enough. So this term gives us that. Now, this is the kinetic part for the, for the ghost, but now we have a an interaction, and I'll write the ghost line as this. So now we have a new ghost gauge boson vertex. But these can only be internal lines. And um, so physically, is there any effect of the ghost particles? Yeah, because they 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 they, they do uh, interact with the gauge bosons. So right. So the. So if, for example, you had, right, let's, let's talk about something that's... Could we see that maybe in like QED where we might have a little bit more intuition? They have to be included in QCD, yes. So if you had a quark coming in and a quark going out, and of course these quarks mysteriously are confined, this is the elephant in the room that nobody talks about. <laughs> It's absurd. All right, so this can let out a gauge boson. But now this gauge boson could turn into, among other things, a ghost loop, which could turn into a gauge boson, which could interact with the quark. And that's the, uh, in the loop, that's a quartic interaction because there's what? what it's a loop, yeah, and, and so the damn thing's going to diverge. Oh, wait, actually it won't. That's, that's nice. Because the propagator for this is going to be 1 over uh, q squared. And so you're going to have 1 over q to the fourth. I guess it diverges logarithmically, but... Um, as things go, logarithmic divergence, that's a bad. And, um, okay, so let's see, what, uh, what, is there anything we can do, can, can, can we have something that's not a loop? So let's do this again. All right, now, um, this can be a gauge boson line hitting the quark. And now what is this guy going to do? Well, it's going to go along and um, it's going to be a loop again. Here's another gauge boson. I guess, I don't, I'm, I'm Uh, I'm just trying 
to see what I can do to. Anyway, I'm. All right, this one at least is a. It's a loop, but this is now a convergent loop. <clears throat> How can you tell that from looking at the diagram? Oh, this is a propagator, that's a propagator, and then that's a propagator. So this goes as three EFs, three powers of Q squared in the denominator. You're only integrating d fourth Q. And uh, this one over here is also going to be a convergent. Yeah, so this is a totally convergent diagram. It would be hell to calculate, but at least it's fine. Um, and uh, so the question is, all right, I pose it to you guys. I haven't played with these ghosts that much. Recently, at least, certainly not recently. Well, um, can you think of, if this is the vertex, and it can't be an initial particle or a final particle, does it have to be in a loop, or can, some, or can it be something else? Can it connect back to the, one of the initial particles? Well, it does that here. What do you mean, though? Directly, the ghost particle. Okay. But then you would probably run into like violations of conservation laws, like you'd violate. But let, let me, like, all right, let's let's, let's 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 be more general. Let's suppose we have two gluons coming in, or two gauge bosons coming in. Okay, so then they can do something like this. And now Trouble is that any time the I mean you just you just never get rid of the damn ghost. You, have, you can have it interact with whatever you want, it's still there. And um, so these two lines, I mean it's almost like the cosmic string talk on Friday. Um, if, if the cosmic string doesn't back on itself and annihilate, then it's infinitely long. And I think, I, I don't see what we can do. I think, I think they just have to do that. All right, well that's, so what's the bottom line? The bottom line then is that to do perturbation theory in a non-abelian gauge theory, you um, have to have these ghosts. The ghosts, you can see, only come in in higher order diagrams, because since they can't be initial or final state particles. So at the lowest order, you don't need them. At the higher order, you do need them. Um, And there's, there's a term, in fact, this is interesting. Um, the, as far as I can tell, just from this argument here, all the, the only diagrams that have ghosts are ones that have ghost loops. And uh, so there's a term called tree level. Like conference scattering? So tree level, a tree level a tree level diagram, what is it? A tree level diagram is a diagram that looks like a tree. So in other words, you can have some roots here, the particles coming in, and then they can, so to speak, connect in one way or another, like that, and then um, they can go up the trunk here and then branch out like this. <clears throat> um, Kevin, let me ask you, so say you do have different of uh, these particles and they meet at a vertex, um, but for them to interact, they need to have a boson for the interaction, right? I mean, they can't just... I'm not confused. What was the subject of the sentence? So, so say you, you have like the, the particles that you drew there, right? The time is going this way. 
This is a crazy um, tree diagram which you have four particles going in and you have, I don't know, 10 or 12 going out. The point is no loops. Right, no loops, but um, do we... So with no loops, you don't have ghosts. So with tree diagrams, tree level diagrams, you don't have ghosts. Moreover, for tree level diagrams, they're all finite. And by the way, there's been, there's been a development, I don't know how, how important it is, but in the last year, there has been some progress in tree level diagrams for non abelian gauge theories. And um, this guy, Neil Turok, who's at the Perimeter Institute, thinks it's very profound. I don't know whether he, he's right that it's very profound or whether he's just trying to attract attention to the Perimeter Institute, where there are, uh, authors from that institute on both of the papers that he's touting. But anyway, those are, so, so, so the question is, uh, can you have these particles interact without bosons? The, go the ghosts? No, these particles at the tree level. Oh, I was drawing this casually. Um, oh, okay, okay. These can be right. any, these can be fermions or, or gauge bosons coming in, and gauge bosons or fermions going out, it's just you don't have any loops in the, t in the, in the okay. tree diagram, that's all. Now, a bit of history, the, the, what happened was when people first, in, well, Yang Mills invented Yang non abelian gauge theory in the mid-50s. And then people just didn't pay attention to it for 40 years, no, not 40 years, but for, Actually, no, no, to tell you the truth, it wasn't that bad. I, I think it attracted no attention in the beginning, but then within 10 years, Weinberg had created the standard, and Glass Allen and, 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 and uh, Salam. Spec Salam, thank you, had, uh, had created the standard model, and that was an OBA gauge theory, so that's the mid 60s. So it really didn't take that long. Um, but people, and, and so in order, to, in order to, to get to that standard model, you had to be able to do perturbation theory, you had to be able to show that it was renormalizable and so forth. And in the beginning, after Yang and Mills introduced it, people didn't know what to do. Um, DeWitt at, at um, he's, he was at Texas for a very long time. Um, he wrote the first paper in which he showed how to deal with this at the one loop level. And he basically figured out that you need something like ghosts. And um, <laughs> then Fadyev and Popov used path integrals, whereas DeWitt didn't use path integrals. They used path integrals, and they, should, they developed this formalism that I went through today. And uh, when people realized that, the, that De, Fadyev and Popov were able to do in a two page maybe three, but two or three page physics letter, the computation, to, not the computation, but the analysis, in other words, once you've gotten this far, you know in principle how to do the whole, all the, to all work and all, all as a perturbation theory. They did that in two or three pages, whereas DeWitt had spent 45 pages doing first order without patterns. So people became convinced Path integrals were very, very important when uh, the Fajayev pop off paper came out. And um, so that's, that's one reason why. Um, they're, in other words, they're conceptually relevant. They, they get to perturbation theory, but once you're doing perturbation theory like this, well, effectively, you might as well use just the ordinary operator formulas. Or you could use bad things, but you, you have your choice. One isn't necessarily better than the other. But to get to that point, the only way of getting there simply is bad things. As far as anyone knows, as far as I'm concerned. All right, so that's another. I'm going to do next uh, the Casimir effect. Um, all right, so I think we can turn the machine over. 